right. Well, good morning and thank you everyone for joining this lightning talk session on deep learning badges and micro credentials. We have two chat options, uh, one on the right hand side of the screen and one in the blue bar below the video. Um, to best organize questions for the speakers, we would like to use the chat feature and the blue bar for that purpose. But we will be monitoring both chats for your questions and comments. Please participate in the session by sharing your thoughts, posting links to resources, and or asking your questions. Uh, to help our moderator, if you're asking a question to um, the speaker, please use a question mark at the beginning of your question. This just makes it easy for us to scroll through and identify the questions. Uh, now I'd like to hand it off to our moderator for this session, Callie Morrison. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I'm Callie Morrison. I'm currently the uh, Interim Dean for Continuing Education at American Public University System. And I have the distinct honor today of uh, moderating this session where I'll get to ask the questions you share and questions that rise up throughout the presentation regarding um, badges and micro-credentials and deep learning contained within those. So I'm going to go through and ask each of our presenters to just give a quick introduction and then we'll pop into the lightning talks and save time for questions at the end. So going across my screen, Claire, would you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hi, I'm Claire Sullivan. I am the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Innovation in Digital Badges and Micro-Credentials at the University of Maine System. Happy to be here. Thanks, Claire. Casey, would you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Casey Thorne, Director of Skills Architecture with Western Governors University. Thank you, Casey. Luke, would you introduce yourself? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Luke Dowden. I'm the Chief Online Learning Officer and an Associate Vice Chancellor at the Alamo Colleges District, a very large community college district in San Antonio, Texas. Thank you, Luke. Uh, Dan, would you introduce yourself? Dan, I think you're still on mute. There we go. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dan Blickenstriffer, uh, a technical program manager for Open Digital Credentials Standards at IMS Global, including Open Badges and the Comprehensive Learner Record, or CLR. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Sarah, would you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Sarah DeMarc. I'm the Vice Provost of Workforce Intelligence and Credential Integrity at Western Governors University, and I'm also currently serving as the Interim Executive Director for the Open Skills Network. Awesome. Thanks for being here, Sarah. Jenny, would you introduce yourself? Good morning. I'm Jenny Reichart, and I'm the Faculty Development Specialist and Inclusion Ambassador in the Teaching Transformation and Development Academy at the University of North Dakota, and I also direct the UND Digital Badging Initiative. Thank you for being here. And finally, last but not least, Kim, would you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Kim Moore, and I'm the Executive Director of Workforce Professional and Community Education at Wichita State University. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Leah, would you start the um, slides so that Jennifer can kick off our first lightning talk? All right. All right, again, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm gonna start this off as is my understanding. I have 10 minutes and we'll move on to the next one. So uh, Callie, go ahead and interrupt, interject me if you get some questions in the chat that I don't see. Um, but yes, I'm going to explain a little bit about how deep learning can be uh, expressed and assessed and recognized through uh, the use of my badges and micro credentials and some strategies that we have used uh, at the University of North Dakota in our digital badging initiative. OK, 
Okay, so first of all, um, if you're you're thinking about deep learning, uh, the best way that I would describe it, if you're not familiar with what deep learning is as opposed to surface learning, is I love the Calvin and Hobbes um, cartoon at the top. And uh, it's just basically explaining what an assessment, a test might look like if uh, a faculty member were, were to give a traditional assessment to a student. They might ask something with um, a question that has a rote answer. Uh, one answer, something like, when did the, <laughs> the pilgrims land at Plymouth Rock? The answer is 1620. Uh, and then Calvin goes on to uh, explain kind of a snarky response about, yeah, I've memorized this useless fact that I'm never going to use again and all of that. Um, and so the point here is that deep learning goes much past that surface learning. Surface learning would be considered something like rote learning, uh, memorization. All of those have uh, power and have place in education. Uh, we use those, you know, as hooks to hang our hat on, as I like to say, for uh, building and scaffolding onto learning. Uh, but they're they're very much in our Bloom's taxonomy toward the bottom. You know, they would be toward the bottom, uh, just basic knowledge, comprehension. Uh, and as we move up and we work toward evaluation or creating, depending on which model of the Bloom's taxonomy you're learning, you're using, that's where we get the deep learning. And I really like this quote here about how deep learning is where you meet the student where they are and that the responsibility of a faculty member is to create meetings of awareness between their knowledge and the knowledge of the students and how to get them there. And then I have another graph that kind of goes between uh, the surface and the deep. And I believe we'll send these slides out. Uh, so next slide there. Um, if you're thinking about divergent learning, so divergent learning is gaining some more traction in higher education and, and in the uh, K through 12 schools. And I really like this because this is something that I did not do, uh, neither as a student nor as a professor when I was a teaching professor. Um, we, we really push critical thinking in higher education, right? It's all we're, it's one of those basic uh, core skills that we're trying to teach our students all of the time. And what critical thinking is, is you can either pose a question or present an artifact or, um, you know, analyze a discussion coming at something with this, this analytical, um, this an analytical mentality. And what happens uh, as a natural response to this is that you, you, you create convergence. And so everyone is analyzing the same short story, like the lottery, we all had to read that. Uh, and at the end of the day, everyone's, you know, coming up with the same, the, the same takeaways from the story and the same understanding based on the guidance of the instructor. Uh, creative thinking does not do that at all. Instead, creative thinking poses a question or a problem and encourages students to generate as many divergent ideas as they can. So um, I like the little model here on the left, you know, about um, the question is posed for divergent thinking, and then you just generate all of these outward ideas. Um, and convergent thinking, which aligns with critical thinking, uh, is that, you know, there's, there's a specific answer <laughs> that is already we're looking for. And we push all of these facts, like through close reading, like, oh, did you notice this in the lottery, that this is what this means. And we're pushing uh, toward a, 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 a specific answer, or a specific set of answers. Um, I have a little meme down here from uh, Midsummer Murders. I love my Brit box. I'm not sure if anyone else knows what that is. But um, Midsummer Murders, Inspector Barnaby, is a detective, um, which I, this 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 has to be the murder murder capital of the entire world because someone's dying every five minutes. Um, but he always, when he's trying to figure out, you know, the who done it, and he can't figure it out, he always says to his partner, "So think laterally, laterally." And <laughs> there was, what does that mean? Um, but as you can see, it, it's it's a it's a method of creative thinking instead of using all of the. Um, all of the evidence to find one answer, you know, you're generating answers uh, based on a question. Uh, next slide, please. So what we've done with uh, deep 
deep learning and divergent thinking at the University of North Dakota is that we have tried to create uh, pathways that are not specific. Uh, well, we started this way. We, we started with specific pathways um, that really didn't lend to a lot of options, you know, for faculty, for students, for staff. Um, we do use the Credly platform, but now we have these unique programs and pathways that are kind of like a choose your own adventure. Um, but on top of that, we even have um, what Credly allows you to do is you can do evidence submitted versions. So for instance, we have some really interesting um, unique programs such as we have a student um, a, a student cooking competition every year. So instead of just badging that students completed this cooking competition, you know, that shows that they did this achievement, we might do something like a generative creative divergent thing and say, oh, you know, this student really, you know, created the most creative cake or something like that, you know, based on a movie. So we're going to give them a recognition for that. This student over here really did like the most amazing work with creating a completely plant-based um, meal. So we might give them a recognition for that. You know, there's there's all kinds of things that we have decided to do to really show the 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 uniqueness of our students and our faculty and our staff and show what they have to share with everyone else that makes them makes them different. There's a great book called um, Range that talks about, you know, specialization is still important, but having a range of things makes us, uh, us unique and these badges can allow us to do that. If you click the, the slides when we send these out, this customer service model, um, it, it, it this explains what we do with the badges and how we kind of go through this process and it's still under construction we're still constantly revising and evaluating our own program and trying to implement uh, changes to make uh, all of these options for all of our stakeholders more valuable uh, next slide Okay, so I've got two minutes. I'm not going to read the whole screen to you guys. Um, so I would just say main takeaways, you know, remember that if students um, adapt and adopt surface learning strategies, they're going to have the surface, they're, they're going to experience surface learning. If they have deep strategies, they're going to uh, experience deep learning. And that that is completely on the or on the faculty to um, you know, foster that kind of learning environment. And then uh, I'll let you guys read through the rest of those as well. Um, but I, I do want to say that I think digital badging can be a way to incentiv incentivize this kind of thinking behind deep learning and divergent thinking, which is uh, not always the typical way that we go about uh, instruction in higher education. So thank you for listening. And I think I pass the baton now. You are like dead on time. I still have that you have one minute left. So you're doing really good. I wanted to leave a moment a for a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, how, how do you facilitate the evidence-based like personalized pathways? Do you have a human they interact with in order to get that evidence into it? How does that work? Absolutely. So if it's an evidence um, submitted version, there has to be a verifier or an evaluator who looks at that and, and matches it to a set of external criteria. That external criteria could be something that we invent ourselves within uh, the institution, um, but it has to be evaluated. It can't just be like, oh, I did something, I, I want a badge for it now. Uh, there has to be a person who is considered an expert in that area. So for instance, if we had a student that was doing a pro, pro, um, you know, a project on ichthyology, they were studying fish, they would have an ichthyologist, a biologist in our department evaluate that work uh, so that it's, it's very much legitimized. So one more question to follow on with that. Yes. Are those all non-credit or is there a credit award with some of those demonstrations of learning? 
That's a really interesting question because I met with our vice president of online learning yesterday uh, to discuss how we can start um, working not just with non transcripted learning objectives and achievements, but how we can do what I call um, co conscripted or co, -co transcripted uh, because we're we're working to recognize um, work that students are doing in the classroom, uh, but that's not necessarily found on a, tr a transcript. So yes, we're, we're constantly revising, like I said. Awesome, we have one last question from the, that follows with this from the chat. Stephen asks, um, and faculty are willing to spend time to evaluate stuff that they haven't been assigned. Yes, they, they are if it's very much in a specific area. I would say that especially our, our med school, uh, we don't have a, any trouble finding people to evaluate their students' work there. If it's something more general and it's not uh, the faculty's area of expertise or of interest, yes, it's a little bit more difficult, but then we would look more to internally my department doing something like that. So it's, it's more for advanced students uh, and areas of expertise. That's a great question. It is. So that I will say thank you, Jenny, and I'm going to ask Leah to move the slides forward and turn the mic over to Sarah and Casey. And I'll start your timer now. All right. Well, uh, thank you. We're so glad you're, you're here with us. Uh, we're going to be focusing our talk on all of the work that uh, Western Governors University is doing around skills. Uh, so if you could advance the, the slide. Thank you. So why skills? Why now? Um, if you have been following the news, you'll see that more and more um, institutions are starting to think about um, how do we recognize skills that um, employees and individuals currently have? And how do we leverage that information to be able to identify the right talent at the right time? Uh, it's like skills is having a moment, um, hopefully a long moment. Um, but what we're starting to see is employers are not just looking for a degree, um, but are starting to think about what are some of the skills that are needed for the jobs that I'm looking for? Sometimes, um, you know, in like in lieu of a degree and starting to kind of really think about what are those needed um, skills and competencies that are going to enable uh, workforce development um, in the future? And so there's a lot of information around um, skilling and reskilling, upskilling, cross-skilling, um, and really looking at um, how are we starting to find those in job descriptions? How are we starting to um, build those into education? And how are we starting to connect the dots? I think one of the, the key values um, around skills is that employers speak the language of skills. And if education can start to think about what skills um, students are learning as part of their uh, either degree programs or a micro credential, then we can start to connect those dots between what um, employers are looking for and between what um, education providers are providing. And then even more importantly, if individuals start to understand what skills they have and can start to communicate their skills and the value of their skills, that's really going to start to connect the dots. Um, like so often you can, you'll talk to a student that says, oh, I'm taking this math class, like I'm learning math. You're like, okay, sure you're learning math, but you're also learning problem solving. You're, le you're learning critical thinking and reasoning and communicating with data. And those are really important skills and those are skills that you're going to see on job descriptions. Those are skills that you're going to see other employers looking for. And so if we can start to pull that information out um, of what we are currently doing and be able to make that transparent to individuals, so that way they can start to understand the value of the skills that they're already achieving and being able to communicate that to employers, that is really going to start to open up this uh, ecosystem and this talent supply chain in a way that we haven't been able to before. Um, I, I don't think I have to tell you, but we do see that um, 
you know, college degrees are a barrier uh, for um, equity. And so being able to provide that value of those skills early on, so that way they're not waiting four years to be able to say, hey, I've got this amazing degree, but they're able to start to show the skills that they're achieving along that pathway and open up those earlier doors. Like, that's a, a big win for both individuals and employees. So um, WGU is uh, doing a lot of work in this area and really understanding what those underlying skills are already in our programs, as well as understanding what employers and the market is looking for for the you know, current and future skills as well. So I'm gonna pass it to Casey, um, who's gonna talk uh, more about uh, the work that WGU is doing in this space. Thanks, Sarah. So as we really started to dive into the world of skills, you know, WGU has always been competency based. Um, we started to explore what it could look like for us to get skills and skills information into the hands of our learners in a more meaningful way. So if we go to the next slide, you can see that we had a couple of um, goals along the way that we wanted to be able to do as we explored skills and these goals aligned with what we believed to be value add to the student experience that could make the return on their educational investment more immediate and equip them with what they need to be able to talk about their own talent brand and the skills that they have in more meaningful ways. So the first one is we wanted to be able to look at our curriculum, understand the high demand skills that underpin the curriculum, and then work to build what we call skills denominated achievements. Um, based on what we currently have and use that to plan what kind of offerings we want to offer in the future. So um, when we talk about the different types of achievements we would award at WGU, it could be a micro-credential, it could be a certification, it could be a um, degree. But understanding what the skills are that are represented in each of those achievements was really important. So that was number one. Number two is it's fine for us to understand what the skills are that underpin the achievements, but how can we help our students understand? And so we wanted to be able to surface these credentials in a digital way through digital badging to our stu students via the learning and employment record and let them curate these achievements in their wallet and then bake the skills into the digital credentials as alignments so that students are not only having conversations with their mentors as they progress through their program and their course instructors as they engage with coursework, but also that they're able to see the skills that are represented by each achievement that they are earning on their way uh, to goal. And then lastly, we knew that skills could be a really powerful tool for being able to provide what we call compassing or directional insights to students. So if they have a particular career goal in mind, um, what are the current skills that they have? What are the skills that they need? And what's the delta in between? What are the skills that they need to build to get there? And what are educational pathways and opportunities that are available to them to help them close that delta, to fill that gap, and to explore other pathways that maybe they didn't even know existed for them or some um, transferability of skills that they didn't know was there? We can go to the next slide. So through the work that we did at WGU, um, knowing that these were the goals that we had around skills, we started some early research with labor market insights to kind of unpack what the skills are that underpin our competencies and achievements. And from labor market insights, you get really great, powerful directional information in terms of key words that AI is picking up and scraping from job postings. But context is everything and lacking in that. And so what we found was taking labor market insights, when you pair it with a very specific outcome statement of what, of what the performance of that skill looks like for a particular job, and then associate it with other metadata like um, ONET and BLS uh, job codes, real-time labor market insight linkages, um, any standards or industry certifications that are applicable to that skill, you start to create a really powerful little data package that we now call a rich skills descriptor. Um, it is a machine readable, searchable data schema that provides the context around a skill and provides some really powerful utility when we're talking about how they can be used in terms of alignments into a student's digital achievements, both from helping them understand the skills that they have, as well as those compassing insights that we talked about earlier. We can go to the next slide. And Sarah, I think this is where I kick it back to you. 
So hopefully you're thinking, wow, this is awesome. Um, WGU thinks, wow, this is awesome um, in terms of really being able to provide that context uh, behind the skills. And through the work that Casey's team has been leading, there was a realization that this would be even more awesome if we had a coalition of other institutions with a like mind around skills and really understanding what's behind the skills to be able to share that in an open way. So in September of 2020, uh, WGU co-led the formation of the Open Skills Network, um, which is a coalition of employers, education providers, uh, workforce development um, agencies, state and federal government, military, and others that are committed to advancing this skills-based ecosystem, right? So this is not just, you know, every group starting to do their own work on skills, but how do we start to connect these in a consistent way? Because to the extent that we can start to use um, a common syntax as we talk about skills, that's where you're gonna be able to start to light up the connections. That's where you're gonna really be able to start to make those powerful um, connections between what education providers are doing and what employers are looking for and how individuals can actually communicate their skills. And so um, that's gonna open up incredible pathways for transferring. Um, that's gonna open up, uh, you know, like transferring credit across um, institutions. And that's gonna really start to highlight um, all of the amazing work that education institutions do um, to support um, students achieving what employers are looking for. Um, if you want to just jump to the next slide, I think we're getting a little close on time. Um, so since uh, last September, we have over a thousand network members and 350 um, partner organizations um, that are all committed to um, this work. I think the, the fascinating thing about this is that it's the open skills network. So this is not um, institutions that are creating their own um, skills in a silo. This is institutions that are committed to sharing this um, skills information um, in, a, in an open format. Um, this is a, um, a network of action. Uh, we have work groups. Uh, we are launching pilots. Uh, we do have a skill summit. Um, there's a link um, coming up in the next slide to show more information. And um, we are constantly working to be able to develop these open skills libraries and share them um, to, with the public. If you want to go to the, I think our very last slide. Um, this is just, as I mentioned, there's over 350 organizations. This is just a really small um, snapshot of some of the organizations that are involved. Um, but if you are interested um, in what the work that we're doing around skills, um, specifically open skills, um, the link is um, on the slide and we can um, post it in the chat as well. But um, definitely get involved, stay connected and um, see where things are going around making those connections, which I think is especially critical as we're talking about micro credentials, right? Employers in a lot of cases aren't sure what to do with micro credentials. People understand what a degree is and there's a lot of assumptions behind what that means, but being able to really highlight the skills that are behind those micro credentials are going to really start to show the value and what those mean. I think that's what's going to, we're going to see really starts to, to drive that adoption um, in the community. So thank you. And I will pass it back to, to Callie. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to keep us rolling because we are going a little, little over. Um, and then, so our next presenter is actually a foursome and I, Clara, there, and then Dan is replacing Kelly, Kim, and Luke. I don't know your exact order. Looks like Wichita State. Kim, you're up first. So if you would take the floor. Okay, well, good morning. Um, I've been doing badging for about seven years now, and probably the question I get asked most by a lot of universities who contact me is, how do I, how do I get started? How do I develop a badge program at my university? And what I challenge you today, instead of asking how, ask why. Why are you developing a badge program? And that will lead you to the how. And so when we talk about ways to use digital credentials to develop skills and talents, 
we look at the why. Why, why is this, our badges important? And so um, one of the things I look at is what's going on in the world today. In every community, we are faced with the fact that we have a lack of employees. There's a help wanted sign on every window. And we have severe shortages in our community correction system, in our health services, in our uh, uh, social services. And so one of the things I've done is I've started a pilot program and a social service program for direct support professionals. And I see this as, as the why. It's the, the why that's driving the how. And that is that we have hundreds of job openings in our direct support professionals who work with those with developmental and intellectual uh, disabilities. And we have a turnover rate of 50% or more each year. And each time somebody leaves their job, it's costing up to $5,000 to replace them in anywhere from 60 to 100 days of a vacant position. So what we're looking at is how do we solve the problem? Look at what's going on in your local workforce. That will drive you to your badge development. So we identified a problem in our workforce and we've set about building digital credentials to address that issue. And we've worked with our local employers and not the CEOs and the CFOs of organizations and companies, but the HR directors. And uh, we're working with local government. We're working with our board of regents. We're working with our academic partners. We're working with our national associations, our statewide associations, all who work with direct support professionals to develop a comprehensive badge program that addresses the skills and competencies needed to recruit and retain employees in this important social service sector. And so that is driving how we're developing badges. And quickly, I would say it's, it's more than an academic institution. But what we, what we found is when we talked to the HR partners that their job descriptions and their hiring practices are not aligning with our badges. So our badges are being designed now where we're reviewing their job descriptions. We're developing the skills and competencies that are needed. They're having to redo their job descriptions and their job postings because they need to all align with the skills and competencies that we are, are putting into our badges. If we don't do that and we're not, and we don't have these people validating our work in the academic institutions, then our badges that we're developing have no value. And so there's no purpose to developing badges that don't meet the needs of the workforce and the employers that are having these shortages. And so I think if there's one takeaway today, I would encourage you to look at the big picture instead of focusing on the small picture of what we do in academia and developing the curriculum and aligning it. Look outside of academia, look to your partners in the community, the national, state and local levels, and look at your hiring practices. And it's all part of the big picture of how to develop skills and talent in your workforce. You are just right on time. My watch just started going right off. So <laughs> we'll step to our next presenter, um, which is the University System of Maine. So Claire, would you like to sure. take your slide? <laughs> I was asked to give a, a three minute overview of what the University of Maine system is doing. So here we go. Um, we are trying to build a statewide ecosystem around my, micro credentials in the state. Uh, the work started as a retention strategy at the University of Maine. Uh, the, that program was called the Engaged Black Bear Initiative. And so since then, we've moved it to the system level and created um, the focus was much more from engagement to workforce development. So we have, um, we're working with 11 key partners throughout the state. And our goal, one of them anyway, is to recognize non-institutional learning occurring within adult education. Uh, we're trying to build that pipeline from for adults to post-secondary education. We focused on four underserved populations in Maine, including low income, Native Americans, immigrants and refugees, and the incarcerated. 
The University of Maine system also has our own initiative going on. We have, we're developing competency-based micro-credentials for our students, for community members, for youth, and for professional development. Um, we are also part of the Education Design Lab's Badge to Hire initiative, which is we're promoting 21st century skill development across the, the system and, and as well as the state. Uh, we realized quickly that there was a lot of confusion over definitions and the value and meaning of micro-credentials. Uh, so to help that out, to decrease the confusion, we built um, a glossary of terms we created. We have our own branding standards that we use, and we developed a unified framework that the University of Maine system is using, as well as our community college system is using. Uh, and the adult education is also using that across the state. So the framework has three stacked levels of badges that takes a learner from foundational level work to more rigorous training at level two, and then on to a work-based experience, an internship or something of that sort um, to give them some feedback on the skills that they are developing. They're all competency-based micro-credentials. Um, so due to the high need- Can you move the slide to forward, please? Due to the high need across the multiple sectors, we, with adult education, we first selected computer support specialist as our first micro-credential. The learners complete foundational work in digital literacy, earning the IC3 credential. They then move on to the CompTIA A plus certification before applying their learning either in a work setting or virtually through the Test Out PC Pro. So they're getting industry recognized credentials as they make their way through the pathway. Many lessons have been learned along the way. We learned a lot more about the specific needs of our adult learners. And we made some changes in the curriculum, adding contextualized English and then customer support training as well into that micro-credential after uh, we started. Uh, one of the things I just wanted to, to note is that time is of the essence in, in creating all of this. Uh, it's very difficult to build this type of ecosystem, uh, to change a culture. Uh, to gain that trust and to develop the content and the infrastructure. A key marker of our preliminary success is the mentioning of our work in state reports, such as the Bioa State Plan and the State Economic Recovery Plan. They specifically mentioned the work that we're doing with micro-credentialing. We are now exploring a more streamlined approach to prior learning assessment and external review to tie non-institutional learning to academic credits, within both the Maine Community College system and the University of Maine system. So through our collaborations, we are establishing a path forward to continue this work. And we just realized there's a lot more work to be done. So thank you. Great job, Claire. Thank you so much. Um, as I see questions come in, I will ask those after, but I think we are doing our last three minutes of this lightning talk here with Luke on the Alamo slide. So I get to tie it all together. And the reason that we're in the business of marketable skills, right? Digital badges and micro-credentials is that there is a move to skills-based hiring. But if we're not preparing students to talk that language and giving them an opportunity to earn uh, evidence, right? Uh, to show employers, then are, are we going to achieve our diversity, equity, and inclusion um, goals? Uh, and so we are very committed to this work. We started by working with business and industry. We've got a, a great partnership with Goodwill San Antonio. And the work that we're doing now, and I'm really talking to you about, right, is how do you move innovation forward and making it a part of the culture um, with marketable skills, digital badges that are integrated in academic courses. We're doing that through our faculty community of practice. Um, and, and a lot of our work is organic, right? We started with just the uh, suite of education design lab, marketable skills. Claire, I heard you, uh, you referenced that. And now we've moved into levels. But every time we consider significant change, we're running those ideas through our community of practice, right? Which are faculty and staff members who have been trained on marketable skills and marketable skills learning experiences and how to integrate those into curriculum. And so um, for us, Callie, this has helped us to create a culture of innovation. Um, this is the how, right? This is the how to our why. 
Um, it's helped us to be thoughtful in our levels. Um, we're going to introduce four uh, this fall, uh, but our faculty is even down to how do we define what those levels are and what they should be. Um, so for, for us, the community of practice is really important, but our why is giving our students, right, a lot of first generation college students in our community an opportunity to be able to compete for jobs that are going to be skills based. Um, and how we're doing it, we're doing it as standalone uh, skills badges, we're doing it inside of our courses, we're doing it with uh, companies uh, locally. Um, so there are a lot of op a lot of reasons, lots of ways, but our real how, the one, if I could talk about one thing, right, our three minutes, this is the how I wanted to talk about is the, the uh, involvement of faculty and staff in creating our ecosystem, right, because it's a, it's a living, breathing thing, it's not just set in stone, and they're very much at the center of that. Um, I'm going to put a link into the chat about some other work we're doing in micro-credentials. Um, I didn't have time to talk about it today, but hopefully this helps you and the work you're doing to move forward your digital badging and or micro-credential strategies. All right. Thank you, Liz. Um, and you kept on time, even though I forgot to start a timer. So um, I have some good, some questions that I will go through. Um, I'll do the first one here. This one was directed at um, Casey and Sarah. And Casey from MSU Denver asks, are there other similar networks to the Open Skills Network in existence in the US? Um, I can take that one. Um, there are other groups that are doing work around skills. I think the, the differentiator uh, with the Open Skills Network is the commitment to open. Um, and also not just are we um, open to sharing how we're defining skills, but we just released um, an open skills management tool, which is an open source um, tool to help um, organizations to create those skills libraries. Um, so that way they can be shared. And so I think there's a lot of work um, that's going on with skills um, and lots of groups are doing them in their silos. Um, but uh, the Open Skills Network is really meant to sort of connect all of those pieces so we can leverage that power and that interoperability that Casey mentioned regarding the rich skills descriptors to really be able to start to connect the, the dots and really make it much more powerful than it would be if we were all doing this on our own. Great answer. Um, I have another question that came in. And I think we've got some answers in the chat, but if anyone would like to expand on their answer, uh, the question was, how does a student use a badge for credentialing or for their CV? And how I would add to that, how do we help them understand? How are your programs helping students understand what to do with those once they earn them? Well, I, I answered it in the chat, but I'll say this, about a year ago, we went and talked to our students, right? We have a student district council that represents all five of our community colleges, and they asked, asked really tough questions. So talk to your students. They'll tell you what you need. And the one question, Kelly, that I love is, why should I care? Why should I care about skills, right? So you have to answer that question before you can get to, well, how do I demonstrate them, right? How do I learn about them? And then how do I use it? But the, the biggest question we were asked is, why should I care? And that was the, uh, the inspiration for the blog post that we shared. Um, so I, I think a conversation with students and an ongoing one is important. I would agree. Um, I'm going to bring us back because I made a moderator boo-boo. Um, Dan didn't get unmuted in time, and so I moved on to questions. So... Leah, if you would start sharing at um, slide 18. And so Dan can share with us the open badge standard work being done by IMS. Let's see if I can. Just one minute. We'll ask one more question while I get Dan unmuted. Um, what do you consider the most innovative digital badges on your campus? Uh, Claire or Kim, would you like to start? We have um, 
we actually have a micro credential in innovation, <laughs> which is uh, takes people through the design thinking process. Um, we do a lot of work with cooperative extension, uh, and they have quite a few very interesting micro credentials. One is in food safety, um, and they they do earn industry recognized credentials that way. So it really is depending on on who is serving them. We're developing out a, a new micro credential that's going to be geared towards research in the Arctic area. Uh, and so it will train learners in how to approach being in those kinds of uh, temperatures. So there, there's a variety. Um, our uh, website has all the micro credentials listed for the for the different types of audiences, because it depends on if it's a student or if it's for the community. Um, so I'll turn that over to the next. Great. Thank you so much. You can hear me okay? Yes. Yay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks for bringing me back in. Um, so very quickly, uh, speak a little bit about IMS and, and um, open badges and our, our open standards. IMS Global is a nonprofit collaborative that is member driven in advancing open standards for interoperability and innovation in ed tech and educational technology, all in the service of learning. Uh, one of those open standards uh, at IMS is open badges. And I wanted to speak briefly to the value of IMS certification as you think about open badges implementations at your institutions. Choosing a badge platform that has been certified for the open badge standard by IMS really is essential because it ensures interoperability between platforms and systems, and it allows that mobility of achievements. It enables learners to claim and display the badge on any platform of their choice. Uh, right now, there are 27 different certified open badges platforms. Um, so by using one of these open badges platforms, you're really not limiting your institution, but rather empowering a better and more consistent learner experience, being able to share these achievements. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Using a certified open badges platform lets your learners collect their learning achievements like earned skills, as we've been talking about, and competencies, and then decide which badges they would like to share with whom in any given situation, like another institution or a prospective employer. The most recent update to the open badges standard, version 2.1, adds a new badge connect API that makes the process of sharing machine readable badges of achievement directly between systems even easier without uh, as much manual intervention. Um, so thank you and I'll pass it back to Kelly. Fantastic, Dan, I'm glad we were able to uh, get that worked out. And I, again, sincerely apologize for skipping there. Um, so I only have one more question that has that I had prepared and that has come up in the chat at this point. But um, on this one, I think it kind of goes to, uh, to everyone who's at an institution. And it's, have you encountered any resistance to digital badging at your institution? And if so, who is it from and how did you address it? Well, I think early on we did at Wichita State, our faculty was resistant. And this is when I say early on seven years ago, um, there were comments uh, to the effect that we were dumbing down education uh, and that somehow badges we were giving away because all of our badges are for credit, that we were giving away credit. And we were going to take away students from their their courses. And that turned out not at all to be true because our badges require between an 80 and 85% pass rate on all assignments and overall in the course in order to pass the badge, which is a much higher standard than any of our academic courses at the university. And in fact, what we have found is that it really is an opportunity for people to learn about uh, perhaps a, a certain part of a profession and then enroll at the university as a full-time student to pursue a career. It's a career pathway. So that turned out not to be true. I'll piggyback off of that really quickly that at the University of North Dakota faculty were the most um, resistant, most skeptical to this process. Um, what I found is that for students, if, if you are advertising the benefit for students to faculty in a very meaningful learning objectives based way they they can you know 
gain some support for students in that way, but the faculty themselves are still resistant. I've, I've had some, you know, this isn't the Boy Scouts comments or soccer team or things like that. You know, I think we've all heard something to that, 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 um, to that, that tune. Uh, one thing that I have found, though, for faculty who are resistant, one thing that everyone gets on board with is DEI work. So if you have diversity, equity, and inclusion practices uh, and projects, programs that you do on your campus that involve uh, faculty or the faculty showcase their work in DEI, everyone wants to be recognized for the powerful work that they do in that area. So that's that's one way that I found to get some faculty buy-in where um, in other ways they're, they're not quite so interested. Kelly, I'd offer a different perspective. We've seen it with frontline supervisors. So if you've got a supervisor, frontline staff, the leadership in that company has got to do uh, a lot of work to explain why are you taking my frontline worker off the floor right, to spend time on skills training. And I'm just convinced we have to spend a lot of energy there uh, convincing uh, and working with companies on why there needs to be time and space to learn those skills on the job, uh, on the clock. And, you know, I'm proud to work with companies that have done that. That's the hardest sell, though. It, the people who needs this, the, need the skills the most are on the front line, and they're the hardest to get off the production floor. Um, so that, for us, has been a... a uh, it's going to be a life's work, right, if we can get there. Awesome. Anyone else want to chime in or? Um, I'll over? just add one um, bit to that. And, it, and it's interesting because I think it depends on how you've got your um, badge program structured or your micro-credential program structured. So, I mean, if you're offering them as like standalone programs that students enroll in, right, that's, I think, a, an interesting market and you're, you definitely have that, ideally, that value proposition there. But one of the interesting things that uh, we've found at um, WGU is that uh, we have a couple programs where we have embedded um, micro credentials that students achieve on their path to a degree. Um, so again, sort of showing that incremental value and tying that back to employer skills. Uh, one of the things that we found, which I think is interesting and, and probably should not be underestimated, is that it wasn't so much about faculty buy-in for that, but it was getting students to understand the value of what they just achieved. And so there was a lot of students that are saying, uh, I don't know why I got this. I enrolled in a degree program. Why are you giving this to me? Like, and so if, again, it's like really tying that back to um, the skills that employers are looking for and the market value of what they just achieved, I think is gonna start to connect to um, some of those pieces, but it's sometimes it's not just faculty, it's getting um, students to understand the power of what they've just achieved as well. If I could, I'd just uh, add one more piece to that and, um, I apologize because I don't remember who, who it was that had said it, but the um, why behind your badging strategy and not just the how. We've had a little bit of the like reverse problem, I think, at WGU where like everybody is so excited about badging. They want badges for everything. And so we have to be like very intentional about our change management and communication, approaching this new kind of like credentialing ecosystem and really um, getting our our whole staff and faculty um, contingent clear on the why <laughs> for badging. Yeah, it's, I'd say that's probably a good problem to have. And absolutely, one of the biggest things I think we're solving for is helping, you mentioned both here by Luke and by Sarah, helping both students and then their employers understand the value of these as they come through so that they don't become a participation you know, check one. So um, I have a question, Dan, I'm gonna push the ask to unmute button. So hopefully it will let you unmute. And I have a question for you that came from Casey at MSU Denver that says, um, LinkedIn Learning is trying to get in on badging. Are there, is there badging system certified by IMS? That's something we're very interested in. And uh, to my knowledge, right at the moment, LinkedIn does not have a, a certification 
for badge for open badges with us now, but it, it's something we're we're very interested in in um, talking with them about. And that's I, I am I am relatively new to to this role at IMS, but that's um, that's what I I believe that's correct as of today. Awesome. Um, in case you don't worry about the, the typo, we all have those. I knew what you meant. Um, so I have another question. Uh, Jennifer is asking, do any of the panelists know of research or data to support that um, badging leads to degree enrollment or um, I would also add to that or retention? And maybe that's something we'll put together and share after is a list of, of resources we've used if you don't have it off the top here. We have just some small case studies, Callie, probably not the depth she's looking for, right? We, yep. have, a, we have a lot of human interest stories and case studies, but. I, you know, I'll jump in and I would say, I would point to the work that was done from um, Education Design Lab they have some work on their 21st century skills badging and what that means for learners, both as they move out into the job market, as well as as they continue to learn. So I'll put their link in the, um, in the chat. And I have some saved in a folder that I'll try and pull the, uh, the list together and send it out with, um, with the content for this session. So um, does anyone have any last tidbits of wisdom they want to share before we turn it over to uh, Leah to do our closing uh, housekeeping? Okay, 10 seconds. I would just say underscore that know your why. And um, I would say that with any kind of project you do. Don't just chase shiny things, even though it's fun understand why you're chasing this funny thing and what that'll mean to your students as you move forward with it. So with that, Leah, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Callie. And thank you everyone for attending this session. Uh, a huge thank you to our Lightning Talk presenters and Callie, our moderator. Um, a session feedback survey should be popping up um, and we would really appreciate you taking the time to fill that out. Speakers love receiving your feedback. Um, we recorded this session that will be available soon for viewing. Um, also, please join us for a fun, casual 30-minute networking lunch beginning at 11.30. Uh, live participants will be entered into a drawing for a $75 Amazon card. So thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have a great day. Thanks, guys.